With three events remaining in the 2017 schedule, Glory made its second trip of the year to France and the city of Lyon, located four hours to the south of Paris, for Glory 47. Ten bouts in all took place, highlighted by some of France's finest, including a French duel between Cedric Dumbe and Johan Le Don in welterweight action, a title elimination bout in the super bantamweight division, as Anissa Mexen took on Funda Alcaius, with the winner earning a title shot against American Tiffany Van Soost at Glory 48, New York. The night concluded with the return of Artem Bakhitov as he put his light heavyweight title on the line against Ariel Machado, winner of the contender tournament at Glory 38, Chicago. All this and more coming up next on Glory 47 Rewind. The Super Fight Series saw three matchups of fighters making their Glory debut. Each fight went the distance and all ended in split decisions. First up in the welterweight division, Alim Naviev narrowly beat Jimmy Vignon. Then in middleweight action, Yassine Agen was victorious over Max Vorovsky. And it was an all-French affair in the light heavyweight division when Abdurmani Koulibaly won a close battle with Florent Kawashi. This was followed by a super bantamweight title elimination bout between Anissa Mexen of France and Funda Alcaius of Turkey. It's quite simply the biggest fight of both their lives. Mexen from France in the white gloves, Alcaius in the black gloves. Both of these girls you're gonna see right off the bat how fast they are. Quick combinations, quick movement, especially in their kicks. How important will that four and a half inch reach advantage be? Well, it's gonna have to be Anissa, uh, Anissa using her movement, pumping her jab, staying long, because Funda's gonna keep coming forward. You can see a lot of punch kick combinations, especially with that left kick. They mix it up early, no big clean shot yet. Mexen fought in Lyon earlier this year in her first ever professional boxing match. She won that fight, said the crowd was great. They want to get behind her here tonight. Funda switching stances. It's actually Mexen that's using her, her pressure style fighting. Funda being more comfortable fighting on the outside. Both of these women, 29 years old, in the prime of their careers. Who's getting a world title shot? Oh, and a right hand. That was the best punch of the fight so far in the early going. It was Alcaius who landed it. Mexen coming in there with that lunging left hook. Just really mixing in that inside low kick. Followed by her jab right low kick. <laughs> Alcaius believes she's improved greatly since her loss to Anissa Mexen. Believes Mexen is about the same. But the same still may be enough to beat Alcaius tonight. You can see what Mexen does. She heads, she creates space. She keeps her distance well. She knows Funda wants to come in and attack. So she's going to hit and just create enough space to be able to see everything Alcaius has. That fight took place in 2014, so it's been three years. Mexen's slowly getting comfortable. She's going to start mixing and moving. We need to see Alcaius continue that pressure style she showed in the beginning of the round. Funda Alcaius' best weapon is her left kick. She likes to throw that right hand left kick like she just did. So if that foot is bothering her, it might slow her down. Maybe that's why her output slowed down at the end of the first round. You can follow us on Twitter. Use the hashtag Glory47. We have a great Facebook page, and you can see all the fight highlights you ever want to see from Glory on our Glory Kickboxing YouTube channel. If you're 
just joining us. Anissa Mexen, who's 92 and three, wearing the white gloves. Akaius wearing the black. And leg kicks so far, not even close. Mexen with a decided advantage. Yeah, she's mixing her strikes really well. She's using her jab and her low kick. She won't let Okayas get any rhythm started. She hits, moves, counters right back. Total strikes land in Mexen, 18 more than her Turkish opponent. I'm wondering if the stance change for Okayas is because of the foot or part of their strategy. Double left kick for Mexen. Good use of the front kick. After you throw a lot of round kicks, mixing in a front kick or a, a nice straight punch is a good strategy to keep your opponent away from you, which is what Mexen wants. Which one of these two fighters would match up best with Tiffany Van Soos? Well, I think it's Mexen. Tiffany's known for her movement, footwork, and angles just as well. So it's going to be a tough fight for both of these girls. Both girls' style involve hitting and moving, not getting hit, angles. You'd think the reach would give Tiffany a little problems for Anissa Mexen if she gets there. Mexen's so long and tall. Yeah, that's, that's tough. But Tiffany's really good at moving her head on angles, getting on the inside. And she's fought a lot of tall girls before, so it's not new territory for Tiffany. Tiffany looks fantastic in her last win, a knockout victory. She promised us a KO, and she delivered it in Chicago. She gets the winner at Madison Square Garden. A quick turnaround for one of these two athletes. Oh. And there are no timeouts in kickboxing. And two. Nope, I think it's the foot now. Yeah. Four. There it is. Five. She may be done. Six. Seven. Eight. Well, she's going to keep going. Here comes Mexen with some hard straight punches. She knows Alcaius is hurt. Let's see what Alcaius has. There's the end of the round. They'll get to work on her. I'm not sure that Alcaius can continue. Round three now. Alcaius knows she has to go at it. She doesn't have much time. And this again is the biggest fight of her life. A title opportunity awaits. She doesn't want to go out in the corner. And that'll do it, I think. Yeah, she just threw that left kick. I think it's so natural for her to, to mix it up with her punches that she totally forgot her foot was hurt. And it's over. Anessa Mexen gets the knockout, but probably not the way she wanted to do it. And the French woman heads to Madison Square Garden where the champ, Tiffany Van Soos, awaits. That's yeah, going to be a beautiful fight to see. Both very talented. The two best women in the world squaring off in New York. It can't wait. So a TKO win for Mexen, the 30th of her career, as she improves to 93 and 3. Now, this is where it started with that foot. It looked like it was a little hurt before, but when Mexen blocked that, it just went right on that sore spot where Elkaius was trying to cover up. I think she's just so used to throwing that left kick so often. There you go. She won't be able to put any pressure on that, but it wasn't even her doing a stop. Tobias Gerald had to tell her to stop. She would have kept going. Here are the final strike count statistic. That's yeah, Mexen landing more, throwing more. Um, and a lot of her success came from the kicks of Mexen. And you can see that she really used those kicks, focusing on the low kicks of Alcaius. We go into the ring now and make it official with Tim Hughes. Ladies and gentlemen, this bout comes to an end with an official time of 17 seconds of that third and final round when a referee, Tobias Gerald, steps in to wave this contest off for your winner by technical knockout, Anissa Maxim. So the stage is set December 1st when the Super Bantamweight title will be on the line as current champion Tiffany Van Soost takes on Anissa Maxim at Glory 48 New York. Up next, the main event of the Super Fight Series featured the featherweights when sixth-ranked Dylan Salvador took on rising newcomer Masaru Glunder. Dylan Salvador here, world Muay Thai champion, has fought all over the world, very experienced. 
came in, was the winner of the Glory 36 tournament contender winner, which gave him his title shot against Sidichai, where he was unfortunately lost the decision there and is working his way back up. As for Masaru Blunder, officially out of the Mulukan Republic, trains out of Mike Passanier's gym in Amsterdam. Yeah, look at his favorite move. We've seen, what, about 12, 13 times already, the knee to the head while standing. He's held multiple world titles, as Todd just mentioned, son of MMA veteran Rodney Blunder. And there's Oops, that so knee that Masaru started right off the bat. He didn't even try to set it up as one of the first strikes he threw. Left corner, white corner, come on. And he's really mixing it up well with his punches, trying to get Salvador to open up so he can slide that knee up the middle. What can Salvador do defensively when he knows that knee's going to be coming? Well, he has on, two on. options. He's got to stay really close to, uh, to Glender, or he has to use more of that long guard where he kind of keeps and tries to push uh, Glender off backwards, or try to counter. As Glender's throwing those knees, try to catch him with some punches. Blunder getting a little wild with those hands, and a counter punch landed for Dylan Salvador. You gotta like the energy level and the output, though, so far for Blunder. Yeah, he looks awesome. He's really using his reach, his knees. Salvador back to the low kicks. Looking for that straight left to the body. Normally, you want to stay at distance when you have the reach advantage, but Glunder has a four and a half inch reach advantage, but he's the one trying to get inside and land the knees. Yeah, because once he found that knee in the first round, he knows it's there. Maybe he should stay outside a little bit, mix up the range, and then come in. Switch up inside with outside fighting. What's Salvador need to do offensively? Well, offensively, he has to, if he's going to stand there and take punches, he needs to counter back. So he's going to shift counter back with his low kicks. But he's waiting too long. Maybe it's time to box a little bit, maybe move on the outside. Try a different right. strategy, because Massaro's running away with it. He said Salvador, oh, in the left hand, that was a hook that landed for Dylan Salvador, but Massaro handled it pretty well. Like Salvador starting to open up a little bit more. And that was a cheap shot, no doubt about it. You can't hit him, okay? I said oh. stop. That might be a point deduction. Okay. And how much did it take out of Massaro Glunder? Stay the corner. I didn't hear the. I thought I heard a break, and he put his hands on the back. This is where he. Salvador takes the back, angles out. Oh, you can see Tobias Gerald yelling. It was probably as he was saying break. Either way, do you throw a punch when you got an one opponent point. like that? No, of I, course, of course, just point. defend yourself at all times. But Absolutely, but come on. Minus. Here's Tobias Jail taking corner. the point away from Salvador. Kunda's really hurt from that. So a point deduction now for Dylan Salvador. Here's Robin Van Roosman looking on. And let us not forget what happened when we were in Paris. Virtual Grunhardt, who fights out of the same gym as Massaro Blunder, landed what many considered to be a cheap shot against Gregorian, which ended up being a knockout. But this one was even more blatant because the referee told him to stop. Yeah, that's a dangerous shot. You can see Massaro just standing there, not even close to defending himself, assuming that that shot wasn't coming. But can Massaro recover from that? And even if he does, how much does he have? You gotta look at it like when you play Street Fighter where you have that energy level. That was a shot that took a lot out of him. This French crowd giving their approval. And Mike, Big Mike in the middle there, not happy at all. So Tobias Gerald did deduct a point from Dylan Salvador. Which pretty much means if Salvador did indeed lose the first round, that he needs a legitimate knockdown now. So Glunder, obviously not where he wants to be. A fighter never wants to give up, but if you're really rattled and think you're about to get rocked again. That's what I'm saying. It's a very tough you. position. You have the crowd cheering. Let's listen here to the referee. Time in. Time in. Yeah, it was definitely late. Now we go back to live action. 
action. And Salvador goes right after him, and that is a legitimate knockdown. But again, the damage was already done. Yeah, this is making this fight really interesting. Seven, eight. Sorrow's not himself. And that may be a knockdown again, too. One, two. So if we have three, three in a round, this fight four, is over. Yeah, five, I don't know if that last one six, was a knockdown. Seven. It looked like eight, he threw the flying knee and five. fell down. But one more, it's over. So Salvador headhunting now. Up. You've got to feel bad five. for Glunder, but this is the fight game. No time to, to cry about it. Up. Got to step up and defend yourself and do something about it. Well, hopefully five. he has 30 seconds now to try to recover. And, and he knocks down. No, it'll be a slip. 10 seconds to go in what, or 20 seconds rather to go. I thought I heard the clapper. It's anybody's fight to win. Three minutes to go in this, our super fight headline. Nice high kick. Let's see how Masaro, he had a minute to recover. Well, you can't really blame Salvador after he was deducted a point. He came out going right for Glunder's head, and it paid dividends with two knockdowns. Nice inside low kick mixed with his punches for Salvador. Strikes are pretty close, 43 to 42. Not pretty close, they're very close. If Glunder can somehow come back and win this fight. What a testament to his heart. Oh, uh, definitely. Boy, he looks like he's recovered pretty well, doesn't he? Yeah, he's blocking and countering with his punches. Blocking everything that Salvador has. What did that knee again did blunder? Just missed. There's an uppercut that finds nothing but air from Salvador. Back to that inside low kick. Blunder becoming the aggressor here in round three. Just ate a high kick, though. So. And this time, Salvador does not Fight. punch him from behind. Yeah, without that cheap shot, this fight would have been totally different. But Blunder still coming forward. It's very possible that Salvador could get two knockdowns in this fight and still not win it. Fight. And are the judges feeling sorry for Massaro after that illegal shot? They are human. If this third round is really close, maybe they give it to Glunder based on principle. Because as soon as that shot happened, the fight totally changed. Nice one-two inside low kick. That's been some of his best combinations, using his straight punches to set up his low kicks. The head snapping back of Glunder. We've got 15 seconds left. Another good punch lands for Salvador. Glunder just returns, fires right so, back. Really hasn't thrown that knee much. As he got caught, maybe slowed him down. No idea what's going to happen here with these judges, considering all the chaos in round two. Here's an impact timeline. You could see where the first knockdown happened, the illegal blow, and then after that, it was two all knockdowns, and it was pretty much all Dylan Salvador. Yeah, it was definitely the changing point of the fight. Did he do enough legally to get this win? Let's find out. Tim Hughes with the official decision. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of kickboxing, we go to the judges' scorecard. Let's look at the totals from our five ringside judges. All five score of about the same 28-26 for your winner by unanimous decision, Dylan Salvador! It's hard to say how much the sucker punch thrown by Salvador affected Blunder. One thing is for sure, a rematch is almost certain. We're just getting started on Rewind. A bit later, a clash of welterweights and the light heavyweight title is on the line. 
But up next, the one night four man contender tournament. Live on UFC.TV, Saturday, December 9th. It's Jamal Big Ben Zadik. I beat them once, it's nothing. Taking on Rico, the king of kickboxing, Verhoeven for the heavyweight title. Yeah, it's redemption. Glory redemption, Saturday, December 9th, only on UFC.TV. What makes Glory unique is the one-night four-man contender tournament featured at each event. On this night, the featherweights did battle. Our first semifinal saw Fabio Pinka go up against Anvar Boynazarov and featured a knockout sure to be considered for KO of the year. Round two, scheduled for three. Fight! You hear the corner of Boynazarov, Arthur Sorsor, who also fought in glory, telling him, come on, Anvar. He wants Anvar to pick up the pace. Again, Pinka is from Lyon, France. Has Great. several hundred friends and family in the crowd. Said that won't bother him at all. I've been fighting for 15 years. I don't get nervous anymore. Do you believe him? Well, he's, he fights so often. Both of them fight so often. These guys prefer to fight every month if they could. But nerves are good. Keeps you honest, makes you feel alive. That's the thrill we love. That's why we do it. Another good combination for Pinka. Pinka gains good momentum. He's got, he's, you can just see from the total kicks, Pinka just dominated. Another good combination for Pinka, who continues to come forward. What does Boynazarov need to do to even the score here? Well, he's waiting too long. He's got to be first and make sure he counters back right away. He's letting Pinka be first and be last. He's got to break his momentum. That considered a push down, not a knockdown. And it's interesting, Pinka's winning the war when he goes backwards and when he goes forwards. Blocking those kicks. Beautiful combination, changing levels. Some of those punches are blocked, but still it does not look good for Boynazarov. But even they're blocked, what it's doing is it's shutting down Anvar's output. If Pinka's throwing, it's really hard for Boynazarov to get good. He says he has the power to shut down Pinka, and he just showed that. He shut him down, and he shut him off. Watch this. It's a knockout of the year contender for sure. What a powerful left hook. Pinka was getting a little too comfortable with his hands down and his combinations, but that's when Anvar started picking up his combinations and followed with that left hook. Right hand followed with the left hook. 61 landed strikes for Pinka, just 20 for Bernazarov, but it only took one, a left hook from the heavens. Let's make it official now, and Tim Hughes. Ladies and gentlemen, you watched it as it happened. We have an official time of one minute, 50 seconds of that second round. This bout comes to an end by knockout. For your winner, now advancing to the tournament final, Anvar Boynazarov. While Pinka was clearly winning the fight, it only takes one punch or kick to turn it around. And in doing so, Anvar Boynazarov will now take on the winner of semifinal two between Aziz Lali and Abdella Esbiri. We're back in the sold out sports palace here in Lyon, France, as we take a look at the highlights from Lali and Esbiri. Yeah, the first round, Esbiri did a good job pressuring, using his boxing, which could have edged him this round. But in the second round, it seemed like Lali was doing a better job landing his kicks and his knees on the inside. And that third round was just almost impossible to score. Both guys had their moments. Again, it was Esbiri landing those punches. He found success with that left hook, but didn't seem to overly hurt Lali, who was able to continue to counter back with his kicks. Here are the strike stats. 59 landed for Lali, Esbiri 73 of 159. 
He's looking at the strikes absorbed as, as Beery really focus on, focusing on attacking the body of Lali. So who's headed to the final? Tim Hughes lets us know. Ladies and gentlemen, after three tournament rounds, we go to the judges' scorecard. Here are the totals now from our five ringside judges. One has it, 29-28. The other four score it, 30-27. All for your winner by unanimous decision. And now moving on to the tournament final. Abdallah Esbiri! That set up the tournament final between Anvar Boynazarov and Abdella Esbiri. Let's see these highlights, Joe, and there are plenty of them. Yeah, it was a very fun fight to watch. Both guys really left it out there. Boy, Nazarov landed some good power in the first round, and then as Beery started to wake up, started putting two good, good uppercuts together, started being as busy as he possibly could, showcasing some good spin kicks, spinning back fists, and then just when both of those guys heard that 10 seconds, it was just an all-out war, back and forth, and there's that intense ending. I'm sure both of those guys would like possibly an extra round of Would love to see these two collide again when they're both at 100%. I have a feeling we will one day, regardless of the outcome. Here are the total strike stats, and it certainly leans very heavily towards the Frenchman. As Beery threw a lot of low kicks that were unchecked by Bonazarov. Strike absorbed. It's as Beery really focusing on attacking the body of Bonazarov, where Bonazarov was focusing more on the headshots. For the official decision now, we go back into the ring and Tim Hughes. Ladies and gentlemen, you watched it as it happened. After three tournament rounds, we go to the judges' scorecard. Here are the totals. One season, 29-28. The other four all score at 30-27. A unanimous decision for your winner. And now, glory contender tournament champion, Abdella! So Abdella Isbiri captures the Ramon Deckers trophy as contender tournament winner and puts himself into title contention. Up next, two welterweights do battle for bragging rights in France. And then later on, the light heavyweight title is on the line. You're watching Glory 47 Rewind. Welcome back to Leon and Glory 47. These two welterweights entered the glory ring with something to prove for Dumbe a step back into title contention for Ledon, looking to improve on his number eight ranking. Who has more knockouts than Cedric Dubé has professional fights. Here we go, Ledon in the black gloves, Dubé wearing white. I feel it's gonna be Ledon trying to use his kicks. You gotta slow down that movement of Dubé. Dubé is staying in the pocket. Ladon said he'd prefer this fight be five rounds, but it's only three. How does that change his game plan? Well, he's going to have to pick up the pace a little earlier. He can't wait. But you got to look at Cedric Dumbe. Uh, his last four fights have been five round fights. Again, Dumbe playing mind games with Ladon. And they got to believe it's hard to rattle Ladon, though, at 34 years old, a man who's had 158 professional bouts. And both these French fighters, the crowd is definitely favoring Ledon. It's easy to not like Cedric Dumbe, especially outside of Paris. And it looked like Dumbe got the better of that exchange. Yeah, he mixed in a quick left uppercut. And that's what also makes Dumbe dangerous. He, he punches on different angles. He'll punch from low, he'll angle off differently. He doesn't throw your traditional combinations. And what I mean by traditional combinations is when you go left, right, left, left hook, right, low kick or right hand, left kick. So he puts a lot of same side combinations together. Nice jab to the body from Dumbe. A head kick from the dome. Believe it or not, Dumbe says kickboxing is his second favorite passion. His first is stand-up comedy. Would rather be a world famous comedian. That's what he told us. But I think maybe he should focus more on the kickboxing. He's pretty good at that, too. Now he says he's not really performing, but he's still writing. 
Maybe he'll give us a sneak preview. He's a creative and funny guy outside the ring and just as creative inside the ring. What? Jerome LeBanner, one of the great French kickboxing heavyweights, taking this one in ringside. We're seeing a different Dumbe just standing there, not really relying on his movement. He's taking the center of the ring and punishing Ladon for, for coming in, doing a heel kick to the leg. We don't see that very often. Very creative. Yeah, he tries to distract you with that kick and then follow up with something. There you go, you see, that's that unorthodox style. He used a left kick to enter with a left hook. You don't see that very often. And another high kick from Dumbe, who's having a great opening round, but he's got to be careful as he comes in because Ladon does have that one-punch knockout power. Exactly. He needs to be careful, he needs to keep his chin down. Just like that. Here we go, round two. This crowd in Lyon really wants to get behind Johan Ledon, a kickboxing legend in this city and in this country for that matter. Total strikes landed, I just mentioned Dumbe with 11 more in round one. Dumbe loosening up a little bit with his defense. First round he stayed really defensively in his shield. Now he's starting to mix up those hand movements and those uppercuts he's good with. And you don't want to come just throwing wildly looking for a knockout against Dumbe because he's a fantastic counter striker. Yeah, Dumbe doesn't hit everything with power. He sets it up. He likes uh, touching and, and finding openings. He's not really known for having that one-punch knockout power. How does this Dumbe look compared to the one we saw against Myrtle Grunhardt? Well, it just shows that he can adapt and fight different ways. We saw a lot of movement, but this is the style I felt that he would have had more success with when he fought Grunhardt. He needed to stay a little bit more grounded, control the center of the ring, not give Myrtle too much space. Maybe this is something they're working on, and this is why he's showcasing it. Flying knee and a right hand from Dumbe. Fantastic exchange there for Cedric Dumbe. And even when Dumbe's defensive, he's just waiting for that low kick. He knows Ladon's going to finish his punch combinations with low kicks. So we're halfway through this fight, and things look tip-top for the best. Dumbe needs to be careful, stopping his own low blows. He's having fun in there. He's the clown prince of kickboxing. I will be the judge. I will be the judge. Dumbe, born in Cameroon, relocated to Paris with his parents when he was just nine years old. I'm judge. Time in. Fight. A true immigrant success story here in France. Another combination. Yeah, it's counters. Dumbe's not going to let you counter. He's going to come right back. He's going to win the points game. He's not going to let you outpoint him. to those heel kicks. I just like how he faints on the outside. You never know what's coming with Dumbe. And Dumbe just seems to throw three or more strikes for every two that Ladon throws. Yeah, Ladon's that power puncher. So he's really relying on getting and landing that power shot. But he might find more success if he doubles and triples up his, his shots. As they say in boxing, the only thing better than a jab is a double jab. The only thing better than a double jab is a triple jab. How does Johan Ladon get the job done here in round three? He's just got to put things together, not rely on that single shot. Start putting combinations together, whether it's kick to punch, punch to kick. Just get busier. which is a hard task against Dumbe, who just keeps countering the counter. 
This is the third and final round. Both fighters probably would have preferred five rounds, but it's only three. Another good exchange for Cedric Dubé, whose combinations have been on point. Let's see if uh, Johan Ladon starts opening up. It looks like he's starting to come forward, trying to throw a little bit more. He's just got to let it out. There we go. Ladon did have a very tough weight cut yesterday. Was off by, what, three or four pounds for his first. I think he was almost three kilos. Yeah. It's almost seven pounds. Had an hour to lose the weight, which he did. He made weight for this fight, but that is never a good sign when a fighter has to scramble to lose a couple of pounds. Foot. Two minutes to go for Ladon to find something special. Total strikes 53 to 38. Fight. Good low kick from Ladon. Good uppercut from Dubé. And a wind up uppercut. And credit due to Doom Bay, who stood right in there and gone toe to toe with Ladon. Not many people thought he'd do it. Is this a new Doom Bay we're seeing, a new style, or is this going to be a one off? Well, I just think he had this style from before, and when you watch some of his older fights, this is the way he fought. It was more when he came into glory and had to fight Holtzkin where he changed his style. But it just shows how well-rounded he is and that he could adapt his style according to his opponents. More of those unorthodox combinations. We haven't really seen Ladon just sit there in the pocket, sit down on his punches and let his hands go. No, it's tough because every time he opens up, he has Dumbe countering right back, shutting his output down. Like right now with 30 seconds to go here, Ladon needs to roll the dice. Dumbe doing everything right. Ten seconds to go. It has been a master class so far for Cedric Dumbe, who's proving perhaps that he is indeed the best. And they'll go toe to toe as the bell rings. We're back here in Lyon. Cedric Dumbe and Johan Ladon. And Dubé just came out looking as good as he ever has. Yeah, he stayed busy with his combination, changing levels, changing strikes, using his unorthodox style to, to land some different things, adding his, his antics, slipping and moving. Mixed with a lot of good pressure fighting. That's what I really liked from Dubé. He was able to stay in the pocket and land some good combinations. Here are the final strike statistics by round, and the edge in rounds one, two, and three all fell to the Parisian. The official decision now from Tim Hughes. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of kickboxing, we go to the judges' scorecard. Here are the totals from our five ringside judges. They all see it the same and score this bout. 30-27, a unanimous decision for your winner, Cedric Dumbe. With the victory, Cedric Dumbe has his eye on another title shot. But up next, the light heavyweight belt is on the line when current champion Artem Bahitov takes on number two ranked Ariel Machado. on UFC.TV, Saturday, December 9th. It's over! It's Jamal Big Ben Zadik. I beat him once, it's nothing. Taking on Rico, the king of kickboxing, Verhoeven for the heavyweight title. Yeah, it's redemption. Glory redemption, Saturday, December 9th, only on UFC.TV. Our night in Lyon came to a close with the light heavyweight title up for grabs. Glory 38 Chicago saw Artem Bahitov retain the belt with his win over Salo Cavallari. 
That same night, Ariel Machado took down Daniel Ilunga and Zinedine Hammerlane to capture the contender tournament and earn his title shot against Vahita. Here we go, five rounds for all the marbles. Vahitov in the white gloves, Machado in the black. You already see Vahitov using his jab and his kicks. Is he going to save his right hand? Vahitov has vicious low kicks. We saw that in his fight with Zach Moikasa. Nice check of that kick there for Machado. Uh, he top turning southpaw. 34 of Machado's 45 wins have come by way of knockout. That is 75%. And that's the way he says he's going to win this fight. Yeah, he throws everything with power. Where Vahitov will set it up a little bit more. He'll change levels, use his punches to set up his kicks. And you can just see how well rounded Vahitov is already with his stance changes. But Machado's landing some hard low kicks. There's a knee from Machado. Boy, lightning quick stuff from Artem Vahitov. Hard body kicks from Machado. And you can see how quick Vahitov gets his hands back up to cover his face after he throws a punch. He respects the power of Machado. The left hand from Vahitov connects. Not sure if it hurt Machado or not, but he is back against the ropes. And now he's, and now he's connecting, a one-two. For Vahitov. Yeah, this is where Vahitov gets dangerous. If he has you against the ropes, he's just so good at changing levels with his punches. He's a closer for sure. That's exactly how he finished Cavallari in the last fight. He was able to get him into the corner and just throw a barrage of punches from different angles. Here he's in his southpaw, saving his right hand, shooting his left straight down the middle. I feel like Vahitov's quicker than ever in this fight. Maybe it's because Machado's a little bit slower. Vahitov staying patient. He's waiting, trying to weather some storms. But then when he has an opening, he just takes advantage of them. A knee from Machado. And Vahitov opens up, which gives Machado some opportunities to land some power punches, but he wasn't able to. Both guys slowed down the low kicking. And a left hook from Machado lands. That was a nice counter left hook. That could be some of his best chances on putting Vahitov out. Well, the question now is, what does Ariel Machado have to do to get back into this fight? Well, I feel he's got to stay defensive, but he can't wait too long. You know, you want to see him throw more counter punches. He found some good counter left hooks. Now, what do you mean when you say he should stay defensive? Well, he's got to stay tight. Vahitov is doing a good job at picking him apart. So he's meaning defensive, he's got to use good defense. He can't rely on his chin. There we go, Machado opening up. There's head punches, 30 to 19. But it was a head kick that sent Machado down for the second time in his glory career. Beautiful left straight. It seems like with Machado trying to block the right side of his body, a left high kick again from Artem Vahitov, maybe just what the doctor ordered. Yeah, it's coming. He's going to threaten with his boxing just when you think his boxing's doing the damage. He slips in that high kick. He tried it there, but it was blocked by Machado. Vahitov looking from that straight left from the southpaw. He's finding good success with the left straight and the left kick. Good combination from the Russian. Home run punch from Machado, not even close. Vahitov staying in southpaw. He's protecting that right hand. 
That's why you see him throwing his left straight a lot and his left kick. Here's a nice low kick for Machado. Answer back in kind from Vahita. Oh, he found that back leg. Nice check from Machado. Make Vahita think twice. Tell you what, Machado showed a lot of heart and courage to get back from that head kick. One angle it showed his eyes rolling back in the back of his head. But he came to pretty quick, got back up, and he's still in the fight. His right eye is starting to swell up. Break. Hopefully stays open. Break. Nice job of Machado back blocking the back leg, but then that's when Vahita switches and go back to the front leg. Feel that left hook's coming. There it goes. Woo. Vahitov's been out of action for seven months, and he's enjoying every second of this. There's another head kick. Machado somehow eats it and stands up. Yeah, it's that tough Brazilian style. It's one of the toughest in glory. Machado fighting out of Curitiba, Brazil. The fight capital of that country. So many great fighters have come from there. Nice combination work from Machado. And another closing salvo for Bakitov. Boy, that could have ended it right there if we had a few more seconds. So this is the fifth and final round. What a straight left from Bakitov. Break! You know, Bahitov still looking for that knockout as well. He's never content. Another high kick. There's that changing of levels with his kicks. Goes to the head and then right back to the leg. Then the jab for Bahitov. Switches southpaw again. Break! Break! Machado's corner yelling combinations. Uppercut from Vahitov and goes downstairs, straight left hand, high kick again. Yeah, he's using his boxing to try to get Machado's defense down, which is opening up his high kicks. Bring those elbows down, open up the head. That right hand got through for Machado. A lot of power still behind Vahitov's kicks. His punches aren't bad either. Machado certainly showing and proving his toughness here tonight. Another high kick, this time with the right leg. Jab to the body from Vahitov. He's really trying to open up those head shots. Downstairs, upstairs. Straight left hand, maybe even a jab. High kick. Vahitov pulling out all the stops, but Machado's still standing. Yeah, he doesn't stop. Break! Break! Even mixing in flying knees. How would you rate Artem Vahitov's performance tonight in his return bout? Well, I still think his hand might be something in the back of his head. Uh, he really focused on landing that left straight. But Break. he still had a dominant performance, Break. and it just shows how talented he is. If you can go, uh, and his hand was still bothering him, he was able to use his left hand and his left kick really well. So without one weapon, he was still able to get a dominant victory. It's got to be bugging him. We, one of his best punches is his right hand, and we haven't seen it as much right. as he usually does. Fight. Well, he had been working on his kicks and landed several kicks to the head, including one that knocked Machado down. And if anything, it's just given him more confidence in practice using his southpaw and fight experience. You can train it a lot, right. but putting it into the fights is totally different. We just witnessed yet another dominating performance from Artem Vahitov. Yeah, he looked great with his boxing. We saw him use and really change up his kicks earlier on the fight, really attacking that liver of Machado. And there was that beautifully timed left high kick from Vahitov. And the way he set it up was just beautiful in his change of footwork. 
him showcasing some of his spectacular kicks. But it was the whole fight was Vahitov really dictating the pace, getting the better of the combinations. But I was very impressed the way Machado was able to take the shots, keep coming forward. Even in the fifth round, he was still throwing a lot of stuff. But ultimately, Vahitov was too accurate, too good with his combinations. And just the way he changes levels with all of his strikes is just so impressive. So hopefully his hand is fully healed and we get to see the full potential of Vahitov when he comes back. Here are the strikes by round. Outside of round one, it was pretty much all Artem Vahitov who dedicated tonight's performance to his firstborn daughter. Baby Nicole was born one month ago. He said this fight was for her and daddy done good tonight, baby Nicole. And you can see all the punishment that he gave Machado with most of the strikes going to the head of Machado doing most of the damage. The official decision now from Tim Hughes. Ladies and gentlemen, after five championship rounds, we go to the judges' scorecard. Here now are the totals. One judge scores the bout 49-45. The other four score the bout 50-44. A unanimous decision for your winner. And still, glory light heavyweight champion of the world, Artem Vahitov. Despite favoring his right hand, Artem Vahitov displayed the quickness and versatility that now has his name in the mix as one of the best pound for pound kickboxers in the sport today. That will do it for us in this edition of Glory Rewind. Up next, an action packed December. First up, New York City for Glory 48 on December 1st. And then it's on to Rotterdam for Glory 49 and Glory Redemption. Highlighted by the much anticipated heavyweight title defense for Rico Verhoeven against longtime rival Jamal Ben Sadiq. And don't forget to check out all things Glory on our new and improved website, glorykickboxing.com. Or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as catch up on Glory features and fights on our YouTube channel. Are you ready for Glory?